Willa Centre. Are we on? Yes. Yes, we're on. Fantastic. What a packed house it is. How are we all? Are we ready for some AI action? Yes, fantastic. Well, welcome to Mind Over Machine, AI, Creativity, Humanity and the Arts. Tonight is a fantastic partnership between this wonderful institution hosting us, the Wheeler Centre, and another wonderful institution, Humanities 21. My name is Natasha Mitchell. I present ABC's live event show, Big Ideas, which of course you can find on the ABC Listen app. And a heads up, we are recording tonight for the Big Ideas program and podcast. The Wheeler Centre, as we know, is all about celebrating storytelling and stories have been created on this land, on this country, for over 60,000 years on this land of the Rawadjuri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. And I have to say, when it comes to artificial intelligence, AI, some of the most compelling, most important scholarship today, challenging uh, and deconstructing the dominant pro approaches around AI, is being done by First Nations scholars around the world. So I urge you to read some of their papers and uh, conference materials, websites. There's a whole lot of great resources emerging now from First Nations scholars on AI. Tonight's bookseller, I just want to give you a heads up, is Paperback Books. Hello, Paperback Books. Four of our guests tonight have books for sale and they will be signing their latest books uh, at the back straight after the event. They'll make a beeline down there. So if you want to celebrate and support arts, that will be your chance. Why not say hello to them, buy a book, get them to sign it, and uh, yay. It's 2023, and the bots have well and truly landed, haven't they? The artist bot the designer bot, the actor bot, the screenwriter bot, the essay writing bot, the personal assistant bot, the bots are here. Many are excited, you might be one of them, about the role of AI uh, in enhancing, augmenting, uh, inspiring our creativity. Uh, artists are experimenting with AI. Again, you might be one of those artists. They're making new and original works. Paul McCartney has said that AI uh, was recently used to produce a new Beatles song based on some demo tape recordings that John Lennon uh, left behind. On the flip side, in Hollywood right now, screenwriters and actors are striking over their work being used to train AI tools or their roles being devalued in some way or at the prospect that they might one day get a first draft given to them done by an AI tool that they then are asked to edit. Universities are scrambling to prevent their students from using the AI chatbot chat GPT to write their essays. Other universities are finding ways to incorporate the tools into the classroom. Authors have started suing OpenAI, the makers of chat GPT, for using their books to train up the chatbot without their permission. What does that all mean? If they don't give over the, the rights to share their books, are they then rendered invisible from the data sets that train these algorithms? That's an interesting question. Uh, chatbot novels are selling on Amazon right now. Companies are turning to AI tools to create artworks and designs that otherwise would have been created by designers and artists who would be paid for them. Hey, interesting time, right? So we're going to talk about all of that. What does the rise and rise of AI mean for art, for creativity, for how we make art, how we value art, for the future of our humanity? We have six absolute superstar speakers. They are here to provoke. And so we're going to start with their provocations, then we'll share a discussion, then we'll open it out to the floor to you. We have two roving mics, they're going to come to you if you put your hand up. Uh, so rock and roll, without further ado, let's hear our first provocation. And I'm going to introduce now Professor Toby Walsh, he's Chief Scientist of UNSW AI, which is the University of New South Wales's new AI Institute. You may be familiar with his three books now for a general audience. The latest, uh, which we're selling tonight, is Machines Behaving Badly, The Morality of AI. He has become uh, an indefatigable, strong advocate for limits to ensure AI is used to improve our lives, lives not do harm. He's spoken at the UN, to heads of state, parliamentary bodies, company boards, 
so many others. He's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science. He was also named uh, on the international who's who in AI list of influencers. Let's give him a rousing applause. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha. I want to set the scene by taking you to 1843, London, 1843. And I want to introduce the main character, Ada Lovelace, daughter of Lord Byron, uh, a gifted mathematician by all accounts, uh, self-taught. And also, uh, many scholars consider her to be the very first programmer. She wrote, in print what is considered to be one of the very first computer programs. Of course, we didn't have computers back in 1843, um, but Charles Babbage, the other character in my scene, uh, had this brilliant idea to build a mechanical computer. Um, he never succeeded, sadly. The world would have been a very different place if he had. Um, but he, he, he was going about it, and Ada Lovelace became his assistant and be, wrote extensively about the computer that he was trying to build, first the differential engine and then the analytical engine. Uh, and Ada had an amazing idea, an idea that was century or two in front of its time. You've got to realize that you know, what was driving Charles Babbage was that he wanted to reduce the errors in all the tables or the arithmetical tables that were produced, the, the tie tables, um, the astron astronomical tables, um, the artillery tables, very manly things. Um, that's why he was building this, this mechanical computer. And that's how he got funding for a lot, very lot of funding from the British government to go about it. But Ada had a remarkable idea, and I'm just going to quote her from, from what she wrote at the time. And she said, it, meaning the analytical engine, might act upon other things besides numbers. We might say most aptly that the analytical engine weaves algebraic patterns just as the jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. That was an idea that was just out of its time. The, the reason that computers are such marvelous, useful, wonderful device, devices in our lives today is because they, they do manipulate other things besides numbers. Those numbers represent musical notes. Those numbers represent dots in a picture or in a video. Those, those numbers, that's why your smartphone is such a remarkable device. It's not just a computer. It occasionally computes tables of numbers for you. But it's a music player. It's a video recorder. It's a games console. It's a telephone sometimes, even. It, it's 101 things that um, we're only starting to, to realize. So that was, that was an idea just so far ahead of its time. And you wonder how, how she could be so, so amazingly creative, although, she, of course, she was the, the daughter of Lord Byron, so maybe there's some good genes there, I suspect. But I want to mention one other quote that she came up with shortly after that, that she tempered that idea that these computers were going to manipulate all these other things that represented words in a novel or words in a poem or musical notes in a symphony, symphony or dots in a, in a marvelous picture. But she also injected a note of caution. And I want to read that quote to you. And she wrote, the analytical engine has no pretensions to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to, to order it to perform. It has no powers of anticipating any analytical relations or truths. Its promise is to assist us in making available what we are already acquainted with. And that's a thought, that's an idea that has haunted my field, artificial intelligence, ever since. Will machines ever be creative? Or is that going to be the thing, the characteristic that distinguishes us from machines? Now, I don't think we have the answer to that question. Computers have made paintings that have sold at Th Sotheby's for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Computers have composed music in the style of Bach that has fooled people. Um, but I'm not sure that we, yet we have the answer. But I'm not sure that it's the right question. 
It's not the question whether computers could be creative. I suspect the answer to that question may well turn out to be true, true that they can. But the most important, the more important question is will their creations mean much or anything to us? Computers are never going to fall in love. Computers are never going to lose a loved one. And great art speaks to those themes of love, loss, mortality. And so at the end, I suspect our artificially intelligent future is going to be all about our humanity. Thank you. Thanks, Toby. Next up, we have Kiowa Scott Hurley. She's a proud Jaja Warung woman who loves collaborating with researchers to scale, to accelerate and optimise their AI workflows uh, on research computing systems at Defence Science and Technology Group, where she works in Port Melbourne, here in Melbourne. Kiowa also happens to have a passion for the arts. You can catch her squeezing comics and ASCII cats into the world of technology. With every opportunity, she is fascinated by ethical IA, AI, I should say, harking back to her philosophy major, where she once argued that sentient machines should have rights too. Please welcome Kiowa. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I was sort of described as a bit of a technologist there, but I've come to this event tonight as an artist. Um, I make quite a lot of art in my free time. I've packed this one with me. Um, I've got some giggles, that's great. Um, and I'd actually like to talk about the value of art from an economic perspective. Um, art is worth more than the money you pay to have it created, to have it shared. Um, but I think it's a really important discussion uh, and it's not lost on me that tonight we're in the Wheeler Centre, an institution that continues to pay artists for their time, for their creativity, um, for everything that they contribute to society. So that's, we're, we're in a space that supports this work. Uh, I recently went to the old Treasury Museum, which is not very far from here. It's near Parliament Station. They've got an exhibition on at the moment called Lost Jobs. It's fantastic. It's all about the jobs throughout history that have become obsolete. Um, Lamplighters. We don't have people walking around lighting our lamps anymore. Um, they're talking about the tea ladies that used to come and serve tea and coffee in the office. Now we all have to find our own cafes and our own really nice conversation with baristas. Um, what's interesting about this exhibition at this time is AI is something that's come up as a topic, uh, AI and automation. Um, where we're starting to think about, well, what does this mean for my job? Couldn't AI do my job? How much of my job couldn't AI do? Should I be upskilling in other things because my job won't exist in 20 years? What jobs will exist in 20 years? What's really interesting about this discussion for me is that I've always thought of creativity as something that couldn't be computer replicated. Um, when you work with people, when you work with humans, when you work with creativity, it feels special. It feels human. But now we have AI generating text. We have AI generating pictures. We have AI generating really interesting marketing material. Um, we now have computers doing stuff that looks like creativity. And so that really challenges me because I've always thought, well, human jobs and art jobs are safe. Those are special human jobs. That doesn't look to be the case anymore. Uh, Mike Seymour of University of Sydney, and I quote, said, the problem here seems to be that we thought creativity, per se, was the last bastion, the last line in the sand that would stop machines from repl replacing someone's job. I would argue that's just some kind of arbitrary notion that people, ha ha had, people had that caught the popular imagination. This isn't the first time that advances in technology have threatened the role of artists in society. So in the 19th century, we saw massive advances in photography. And in the 19th century in the Western world, we were obsessed with science, with cataloguing, with observing, with recording, with gathering information. And a photo, well, that was perfect. Humans make mistakes in artworks. You draw a picture of a plant, it's gonna have mistakes. A photo, well, that's real and true and perfect. Uh, that's something we're sort of seeing with AI right now. A lot of discussions I've had with people around AI is, 
revealing to me that there's an assumption that because it's a technological innovation, because it's generated by a computer, what comes out of it must be true, it must be right, it must be correct. It's more correct than the people we work with. Um, what's interesting in this period where we're looking at real art versus mechanical, industrial, robust scientific photography is these criticisms that start to come out from people like Charles Baudelaire. Um, he was really into art. He, was, he loved it. Uh, and, and I'd like to quote him here. Since photography gives us every guarantee of exactitude that we could desire, they really believe that, the mad fools. Then photography and art are the same thing. He then goes on to say, what man worthy of the name of artist and what true connoisseur has ever confused art with industry? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> now, AI is very human informed. The data that goes into these systems is generated by us. Uh, the people that program these systems are people like me, and I'm, I'm, I'm a person, I make mistakes. Um, what's interesting is that over time, we came to accept photography as a form of art. Um, we came to acknowledge that it was uh, its own type of artwork, and so it was valuable in ways that were not just the commodification of the world around us. Artists also continued to have a role in society with paid jobs. This raises questions for me around, will AI eventually be considered an art form? Um, if anyone in the audience has ever tried to type anything into ChatGPT or one of the art generation AIs like Stable Diffusion, you'll know the first thing you type in doesn't give you an output that was actually what you wanted. You actually have to learn how to tell it to give you the stuff you want. Um, that calls into question to me if prompt engineers, people that think about clever ways to get answers out of AI, become artists of their own. Um, I've actually seen Instagram accounts already of people who uh, call themselves artists and what they mean by artist is that they make AI generate cool stuff. So that's interesting. Regardless of whether AI eventually becomes its own separate artistic endeavour, it definitely calls into question the role of artists in society. How do they continue to get paid in an environment where tools like Adobe Firefly exist, where you can drag and drop things and generate beautiful emails and templates? What does it mean for people like me who like to draw comics for my blog posts? Should I be using AI to do that to save some time? What is the world missing uh, when we leave art to AI? And, and how do we ensure our artists continue to get paid when AI can do so much of that heavy listing? Thank you. Fantastic. What a set of questions to explore. Thanks, Kiowa. Next up, we've got Jeremy Wartsman. He's the founder and director of the Jackie Winter Group, a leading creative services agency with offices here in Melbourne, New York and London. He also heads up an associated gallery space at Lamington Drive, related artist residencies, Jackie Winter Gardens and Jackie Winter Waters. In a previous life, he was co-founder of a design practice, uh, as well as one of the founding publishers and designers of Is Not magazine. In his spare time, apparently, he's into ice hockey and Tibetan Buddhism, and he he had an interesting experience recently, an experiment with AI that I think he's going to talk about. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Okay, this is the shortest talk I've ever written, so I had to write everything down, and I'm going to be reading it. I'm going to try to look at you. I don't see anything, but if it's a bit dry, we'll loosen it up in the Q&A. Um, so, the title of this, There Is No There There Yet, Five Lessons We Learned From Trying to Make AI Doubles of Our Artists and Why We Eventually Gave Up. So when I was originally approached for this talk in May, we were knee deep in something called um, Wacky Ginter. We wanted to launch the first AI illustration agency and create AI doubles of all of our artists with the goal of opening new revenue streams and empowering our clients. And I thought that by the time July came around, we would share some of our wonderful learnings from the top of the mountain. But instead, Wacky Ginger is in our product graveyard gathering dust. <laughs> Therefore, tonight I'm going to share a bit of what we learned in this very chaotic ride and cover five brief takeaways of why we abandoned the AI pursuit for now. So this will come as no surprise to many of you here and to the actual experienced members on this panel, but leveraging AI or any meaningful way to build new products based on AI is very, very hard. Um, and 
I did not know that. I think one of the reasons that such a hype spiral developed, especially around art, is that everyone deeply really wants to be creative and an artist, but that is also really hard. Um, but now there's something that makes it easy and instant, so of course there would be a huge rush towards that. So we have these AI tools, they spit out amazing looking art, but when we actually start to do our own development, it became clear that it was a bit of a mechanical Turk situation in some ways. To properly train a model requires very specific images to be made and a whole lot of writing. Every image in the set needs to be described in detail and without proper training of a model, you just end up with rough averages of imagery. Some of you may have even read recent articles on AI caption farms in some underdeveloped nations where this work is being farmed out en masse. But in short, the barrier of entry is very, very high right now. It's like when the iPhone app store first came out in this huge kind of gold rush towards that area. And what we're seeing right now in these tools is really just the emergence of the tip of the iceberg based on decades of research and development that's come before. This also starts to get into why most AI artwork kind of looks the same, and maybe we can get a bit into that in the Q&A. But in the end, it was nearly impossible to train a model to the unique qualities that made up an artist's work actually their own. Um, this leads to our second finding, which is that all AI art needs to be prompted, something that Kyra mentioned before. And this prompting re still requires really vivid imagination, desire to manifest something into the world, knowledge of our history, writing skills, and these are traits that are not inherent in many people, especially clients who commission commercial illustration. Um, I think this is why we value and admire artists, and in a commercial sense, why artists actually exist. Uh, they take the loose information of a brief, they run it through their brain, and then they make something else. Um, it's, you know, if there's one thing that clients in advertising lack, it's patience and subtlety, um, but they are not short on good ideas and inspiration. So while some of the tech can get us halfway there, in terms of kind of becoming a good brainstorming partner, we still have this problem that's um, you know, talked about in, in commuting, like this last mile problem, that the end work still needs to come from an actual artist right now, someone who can step into the mystery of creation with another person and tap into inputs that go much deeper than words. The biggest factor in our decision to abandon our project was a legal one. So again, we heard about Adobe Firefly, which is something that uses a free range set of data, um, which is still controversial because a lot of the people who um, you know, signed off on having their artist artwork used in that data set probably didn't know it was going to be used for that. But anyway, um, the largest platform that's currently used in most communities is called Stable Diffusion. Um, and one of the big problems with stable diffusion is that even though it's in a minority of the artwork trained in the data, it is still a minority of work that has been illegally scraped from other sources. So much like the days of Napster, which eventually gave birth to the streaming era, I think we'll have a similar shift in some regards how visual artwork is treated. Um, but for now, the liability is way too high for clients to commission. Um, so we're starting to see that change a bit around AI work, but at the moment, even if you wanted to train a model on your own work, which is what we were trying to do, you still need to interface with another model like Stable Diffusion, which is still questionable in terms of its origins. Um, so maybe some of us know when life gets too easy and comfortable, sometimes we get bored and sad. <laughs> Um, and for many of our artists, the pleasure is actually in the inherent struggle of creation and the joys in the craft. For many, creating art is a process of nourishment and money is often a byproduct. Of course, AI represents a financial threat to our industry in a very big way that we've already seen an impact in. But at the end of the day, while many of our artists found the project or sorry, found the process magical, um, it was also somewhat sterile. Now, we're starting to see more subtle integrations of AI into our usual tools. So something like Photoshop has released their new generative fill model. Um, and I think that like these tools are going to provide some much needed support for artists in ways that we might not be expecting. And there is valid work being created by AI that is interesting, that has utility, but the soul of the artist is still glaringly and obviously absent. And the initial excitement and curiosity from our artists soon faded to resistance and disinterest. So where does that leave us? It's been fascinating because two of the biggest technological disruptions in recent time, the blockchain with NFTs and AI, both propelled digital artwork into the mainstream, and the clash of art and commerce continues to rage on. And as an illustration agency, we've somehow lucked ourselves into the front row. And from what we can see, it's clear that ultimately there is a there there somewhere. And to that end, we've been actively encouraging our artists to continue exploring the technology, as I think the eventual end use that will emerge will be more surprising than we can imagine right now. So along with everyone else, we're remaining curious and cautious, but also continuing to get our hands dirty as well and not waiting for something to happen, but trying to shape it somehow, given our unique position and access.
So I'll just finish with a story that happened the other week, which was kind of related to this. Um, I was visiting a surgeon to look at what I thought was a hernia, and they sent me to get an MRI. And the surgeon was thinking about it for a bit. I told him where I lived, and he got really flustered, trying to find a place to send me. I live in the Dandenong Ranges, and he really wanted to send me somewhere to ensure that there was someone with a good radiologist that he knew, and he didn't know anyone around me. And he said that was actually the most important part of actually this imaging. And this really surprised me. And in that moment, I really found myself rooting for this AI revolution, something that can pick up this information on a scan without relying on the imperfections of a human who may be rushed, having a bad day, or depending on how far they live from me. But apparently still, for all the innovation we've had in the medical space, all the billions of dollars poured into this amazing technology and machines, at the end of the day, it always comes back to an ordinary human being who has to look at a computer screen, interpret the images, and see something that nobody else can perhaps see. So maybe art and science has more in common than we think, which is the trained eye. Um, and in many ways, though, we're still staring at this blank canvas, and it'll be up to the artists themselves to figure out what story they're going to tell with this new technology. And we as agents, as always, will be here to support them. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeremy. The ordinary human being, I think sometimes we forget how extraordinary we are in our ordinariness. Uh, terrific presentation, thank you. John M. Green is with us next. He is the best-selling author of six thrillers. His latest is Framed, an art heist novel. He's chair and co-founder of an independent book publisher, Pantera Press. I wonder if he'll be publishing uh, chat GBT novels anytime soon. We will find out. He's director of, the unli of unlisted and listed companies with a long time focus on the risks and opportunities of new tech, uh, including currently the Cyber Security uh, Cooperative Research Centre, uh, UOW's Global Enterprises and Challenger, and previously the National Library of Australia, QBE Insurance and Worley. His prior careers are very interesting, law and investment banking before he became I'm a thriller novelist. He's also an aficionado, apparently, of the art of magic. Let's give John a big welcome. Thank you, Natasha, and good evening, everybody. Um, AI every day has got me lurching between terror and ecstasy. And I hope with all that lurching, I don't get a hernia that Jeremy was talking about a minute ago. But hang on, I've kind of felt like this before. Like when I was an expectant father standing in my wife's maternity ward. Having kids is a massive risk with huge unknowns. Yet, many of us still do it. Will they be healthy or not? Will they strengthen our relationship or tear it apart? Will they grow up to cure cancer or will they become serial killers with us, their first victims? <laughs> with kids, we don't have a clue. And I think it's the same with AI. Right now, we're all in a struggle between AI fear and cheer. The fear, stop AI before it kills us or in the shorter term, before it kills our jobs, partly why Hollywood is on strike, as Natasha said. The cheer, people singing Hakuna Matata, or no worries, how AI will create more jobs than it will kill, how we're about to enter a golden age of creativity. Who's right? Time will tell if we have time. AI's got lots of defects right now. Remember RoboDebt, big, te big tech getting bigger, stealing of intellectual property, biases, hallucinations. I'm going to focus on hallucinations, pardon the pun, which is, why, which is AI's tendency to make stuff up. It can be really bad, like falsely accusing a law professor of sexual harassment. And as a book publisher at Pantera Press, I have two words for that, serious unease. But as a novelist who makes up stuff for a living, I've got one word for that, respect. <laughs> Why? Because we creatives can hack AI's tendency to hallucinate and gain extraordinary productivity boosts. Here's how. Just like we can dial up and down 
the contrast on the photos on our smartphones, some AIs let us dial up and down the heat or the temperature of randomness that leads to hallucinations. So if you dial up the hallucination temperature from cold to hot, from zero to one, you'll dramatically transform the AI's outputs from kind of factual or logical right up to the wild and crazy. It's not true creativity, but it's a crude proxy. So in preparing for this event, I used this AI hack to mimic a challenge I'd set for myself a few years back writing one of my thrillers, Double Deal. I put my hero, Tori Swift, in a deliberately impossible situation, facing imminent death, clock ticking, tick, tick, tick. How could I create a dramatic twist for Tori that would surprise readers but still be believable? Now, at first, AI's ideas were dull, vanilla. But when I turned up the hallucination heat, it cooked that vanilla into creme brulee, <laughs> including the exact twist that I developed for Tori myself those years ago, except I'd taken days, maybe weeks, to figure it out, and AI did it for me in a couple of minutes. Did AI do that by itself, or did it scrape my book and steal my idea? I have no idea. AI didn't know either. Now, that theft question aside, a creative productivity boost like that, you'd have to agree, is pretty extraordinary. Yet it also provokes the bigger jobs question. If AI is going to replace us, will gains like that be mere short-term sugar frosting on uh, an eventual dust bowl? Let's ponder that question with that old story about a bear that's rampaging in a campsite. One camper ties up, starts tying up the shoelaces on her Nikes, and the other one says, hey, you can't outrun a bear. And she says, true, but I can outrun you. <laughs> now, like that camper, I suggest it won't be AI that takes our jobs. It'll be people who use AI better than we do who'll take our jobs, at least in the shorter term. So in that vein, here's a provocation for how we humble writers might weaponize AI to democratize movie production, to beat those Hollywood um, nasty people. <laughs> now imagine this. My latest novel, Framed, a thriller about an art heist, is a New York Times bestseller, and three movie studios are rushing me to option it. Now, sadly, that's not entirely true. But like I said, imagine that. Now, we know that authors mostly get paid bugger all for options. And if the studio does end up making the movie, which usually they don't, we'll have to contend with what's called Hollywood accounting, which is a form of bookkeeping that someone like Bernie Madoff would find creative. So instead of doing that, I go rogue. I upload my full manuscript into an AI model called Screenify. I select from a bunch of drop-down menus, genre, length, directorial style, background music, main locations, actors. And by the way, in my provocation, the directors, composers and actors have all licensed their work, images and voices, and getting paid for it. I press create, and minutes later, <laughs> up pops a pretty good trailer and a full 90-minute feature. I can use the trailer immediately to pitch framed to more studios, or to bypass them entirely, I can upload the full feature to a self-streaming movie website. Let's call it Glamazon. Now, will we authors ever make movies like that? Or will our AI child grow up to kill us before we ever find out? Thank you. What a scenario. I'd love to hear from some of the authors in the room on that one. Thank you, John M. Green.
Richard King is next. He's an author and critic based in Fremantle in WA. He's flown here today. Thanks for being with us. His latest book, uh, also in the bookshop, is Here Be Monsters, Is Technology Reducing Our Humanity? He has been published in all number of publications from The Age to The Independent to The Monthly, Griffith Review, Mianjin, uh, too many to list. Uh, and including anthologies, The Best Australian Poems and The Best Australian Science Writing. He regularly writes for Arena Online and Arena's Quarterly Magazine, is an active member of uh, the collective that drives Arena. Uh, he focuses particularly on culture and technology. A big welcome, a big Melbourne welcome to Richard King. Thank you very much, uh, Natasha, for that lovely introduction, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to read as well, uh, otherwise I'll just take up too much time, wander off point. Uh, when ChatGPT first bubbled up into public consciousness late last year, many journalists decided to incorporate content generated on the platform into their reporting on it. Given the job losses to which ChatGPT may lead, this was perhaps an unwise course of action. Like a caveman ostentatiously sporting a bronze medallion towards the end of the Stone Age. Nevertheless, it made a point that in terms of formulaic expression, ChatGPT is serviceable. Today, we're invited to address the relationship between AI and creativity, especially as it relates to the non-formulaic modes of expression we categorize as the arts. In the few minutes that follow, I'd like to make some very general comments about what I think that relationship might and might not, and perhaps should not, entail. I begin from the position that creativity is central to human agency, which is central, in turn, to our freedom and flourishing. Freedom is not merely a formal political arrangement limiting the power of governments to say what we can and can't do. It depends as well on our ability to pursue meaningful activity activity that allows us to extend and explore our humanness. A freedom devoid of this second element would, in my opinion, be no freedom at all. What we call the arts have performed many different roles in society, but one thing they've done implicitly, at least since the Renaissance, is to celebrate creativity. This is one of the reasons we value them at both the personal and the social level. But art, also has a broader meaning, which relates to human creativity in general. It's a mundane point, but I think it's an important one, that one cannot write the phrase artificial intelligence without also writing the word art. Like all technologies, ChatGPT, DALI, and their equivalents are artifacts, products of human creativity in this more general sense. But here the relationship of creativity to freedom is more complex. For while we can and do create artifacts that disburden us and thus extend our freedom, we can also create artifacts that disengage us and so limit our freedom. Technologies of automation, for example, can liberate us from backbreaking labor, but they can also imprison us in alienating work or rob us of the embodied social relationships we need in order to flourish emotionally. The creativity needed to build machines isn't always conducive to creativity in general. So how does AI fit into this picture, given that the thing being automated in this case is the very phenomenon, human intelligence, without which we wouldn't have any technologies at all, let alone any art or literature? I have two connected thoughts about that. The first, which I'm happy to elaborate on, is that whatever creativity AIs are capable of, it is of a categorically different kind to the creativity engaged in by us. And the second is that, given the store we set by human creativity, we would want to think very carefully indeed about how we use AI in this space. It's not enough to say, as the tech bros do, AI is just a tool like any other. We need to ask what kind of tool it is and what its sudden and largely unsolicited emergence means for the creative human animal. We need to ask what we want from this technology, and the question of what we want is a question about who we are. Not wanting to follow the example of our Neolithic Barry Gibb, 
bronze medallion glinting amidst the copious chest hair, I didn't use ChatGPT in order to compose this note, but I did ask it to prompt me with a question about the topic of this debate. And it responded, not at all stupidly, are there any concerns that AIs may replace or devalue human creativity? Notwithstanding that my fellow panelists may change my mind in the course of our discussion, I would for now answer that question as follows. I see no reason whatever to think that AIs can replace human creativity, but the idea that they can replace it or that in some sense they approximate it is itself a devaluation, not just of human creativity, but of humanity per se. And one would hope to see the arts and indeed the humanities in the vanguard of those who say so. Thank you. Richard King, thank you very much. Will AI art devalue, well, art and will it devalue our own humanity? Lots to talk about there. Uh, last but most certainly not least, Lizzie O'Shea is a lawyer, a writer. Her book, Future Histories, looks at radical social movements and theorists from history and applies them to current debates about digital technology. She publishes regularly about law, about tech, about human rights. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Guardian and Sydney Morning Herald, amongst other places. And uh, she is here to share her provocation right now. Welcome. Thank you so much, Natasha. Thank you to my fellow provokers and to what seems like a lovely audience. Um, Maybe because I'm a lawyer, I can't help but start with definitions and not necessarily because I think we have to agree on what is artificial intelligence, but I think the slippery nature of the term does serve a particular purpose when it's deployed. What does it hide and what does it reveal? And I like to refer to Kate Crawford's definition of artificial intelligence, that it's neither artificial nor is it intelligent. And her work, as well as the work of many other scholars, aims to map out some of the material inputs that go into building these systems, whether we talk about the components of computing, so from the rare earth, being mined, rare earth minerals being mined in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo, to the computers being manufactured in places like Shenzhen, uh, that there is a real material set of resources that go into building the computing power that powers AI. And then, of course, there's the data sets that are then used to train these computers, and they're often taken without people's knowledge or consent. Uh, they are often uh, said to be doing something when they may not be doing that at all. So, you know, uh, crime statistics uh, tell us perhaps what crime is, but in fact, I think there's an, an argument that in fact what they do is show us what the state's response to crime is. So interesting in the way that these data sets are both curated, but also full of inherent bias and can be quite mysterious. And then of course, there's the human labor that goes into the categorization uh, the, the bootstrapping of these models and the training of them and the huge complexity associated with that. What is it to identify a human face as being either happy or sad? And what is it to identify a human face as either male or female, for example? And how, how intense are the cultural specificities of that kind of categorization? And is that re relational to where these systems are deployed? And so I think how we respond to the questions raised by artificial intelligence and its regulation, I think will be defined by how we respond to power. Because behind that empty chatbot, behind that search term bar waiting for a prompt, is an enormous marshalling of resources, an organisation of resources, and an exploitation of a group of people who are working very hard to produce these systems. And it might glow behind a blue light, but it's certainly there. And that is a source of power. We need to think about it in terms of power, in terms of industry, marshalling a huge amount of power to, to coordinate these resources and build these models. Uh, and we also need to think about government, who... Uh, in fact, have uh, are probably one of the few entities that can take on the power of industry and how they choose to regulate or not regulate will be pivotal, I think, in our future. Of course, governments themselves can't help but love using these systems for their own particular purposes, RoboDebt being an example, but there are many others as they infiltrate all sorts of systems, including things like criminal justice, which is possibly the highest stakes when it comes to these kinds of questions. If we are developing these systems to replace human decision-making with systems that are designed for profit, 
the reality is that people will be used as fodder to feed these machines and they'll be treated essentially as cohorts, nameless cohorts, upon which these machines are tested. And I think for that reason, to talk about the inherent dignity of people, to talk about people as rights holders, actually directly challenges those two sources of power. And that's why I am a rights advocate. I use a human rights focus because it brings that, that focus, that distribution of power into focus and tells us how we can talk about it differently. It's aimed at stopping trying to privatise the gains of the automation revolution and socialise the harms, which is the current posture. So it's not about banning a particular chatbot or a program, for example, but it's about building a politics of resistance at each of the points in which AI is being built um, right across the globe, but then also the points at which it's being deployed and giving these people, working together with people, to build the capacity to say no. Now, I should say I'm not actually pessimistic about the potential of technology or artificial intelligence. I think some of the doomsday talk that we see coming from tech bros is a bit silly. Uh, and I think it's a nice rhetorical trick that kind of disguises the reality that harms are being experienced actually in the here and now, not in some far off distant future. But I think our approach should absolutely be humanist. It should be to centre the concerns of, of people and their desires in how they want to live, rather than to defer somehow to the magical thinking of machines or to be inspired by that without understanding the complex material reality that lies beneath. And if we build technology around people's rights and responsibilities with that as our key focus, that's how I think we can deploy technology for a better digital tomorrow. Thank you. So better art, what do you think? Not today, I, I don't, I'm not gonna discount the, the future where they could. The art today I think is very much a prestige. If you ask it for a painting of, of a cat in the style of Picasso, it will do a pretty good job of making, you know, the internet was invented for paintings of cats, right? <laughs> um, in the style of Picasso better than I would do. I'm not a particularly good draftsman, but um, whether, you know, what made Picasso great was the fact that he reinvented himself half a dozen times and he changed the way that we saw the world. He, he gave us new ways of seeing the perspective, of seeing what you could do with painting. And it wasn't some melange, some mixture of previous art. It was something quite new. Mm. And we don't know where that came from and we don't know how to build machines, at least today, to do that. Jeremy, you have a, a, a suite of wonderful flesh and blood beating heart artists in your, in your portfolio of creatives that you represent. So why did you want to try and get them to uh, somehow interact with AI? Like what, what, what was at the heart of this experiment? Were you hoping for better art? I mean, that's a good question. No, I don't, I don't necessarily think so. I think the, the process of commissioning custom, custom work is, is so fraught with all of these human things in terms of really trying to broach um, you know, these commercial goals and outcomes to a very messy and subjective process. And one of the things we try to do as agents and producers, we try to take, sometimes we try to take the subjective, subjectivity out of it um, and really kind of figure out how to put a framework around that. And so one of my, it, it was an open question to see, you know, could we do that somehow? If we gave clients a bit more control in terms of how they wanted to interact with artists, because one of the, it can be a very frustrating process sometimes. You're doing so many revisions and, you, and you, it's like, I'll, this, we have this, we have this thing where you say like, oh, I know it when I see it, but then how does that kind of happen? And you have to have a container when you're working that way. So one of the That's ideas the was, mess of humanity. Yes. Right yeah. there, the mess, the creative, messy process of making art. Exactly, and, that, and that's what we discovered. And I think what we discovered is that people actually like that, and that's mm -hmm. something that's worth preserving. Richard King, you've got some thoughts about that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think in any meaningful sense AIs will ever create a work of art at all. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's only something that another human being can do. And it's a two-way street. There's the experience of the artist who creates the art. Um, there's subjectivities, if you like, and there's the subjectivities or the experience of the people who appreciate the art. Now, that's not to say that you won't get, so, you know, when uh, ChatGPT uh, first kind of uh, came onto the scene, 
late last year, there was uh, a little uh, blog post on Nick Cave's uh, website that went viral and he was talking about how a, a fan had got in touch with this song and they said, you know, I, I asked ChatGPT to do this song in the style of Nick Cave, do you think it's any good? He said, no, it's absolute rubbish. Uh, and it'll always be rubbish, no matter how good it is. Do you want to know and, what he said? He yeah. said, songs arise out of suffering, yeah. by which I mean they are predicated upon the complex internal human struggle of creation. <laughs> and, well, as far as I know, algorithms don't feel, data doesn't suffer, chat GPT has no inner being, it's been nowhere, it's endured nothing, it has, n has not had the audacity to reach beyond its limitations and hence it doesn't have the capacity for a shared transcendent experience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. As you would expect Nick Cave to say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it has, yeah, I mean, and he's, he's kind of right. I mean, I, I don't think art need, it needs necessarily to be about suffering, but it, it certainly it has no intentionality. It has no aboutness. It doesn't have an experience of a flower um, in the way that I have an experience of a flower that distinguishes that experience from just photons hitting the flower and entering my eye. It has it, its own experience no, of the flower. No, it doesn't have any ex experience. It doesn't have any intentionality in that human sense. It doesn't have a boundness. Okay, so, um, I mean, we'll, we'll get into this. But, um, but Nick Cave's maybe a little bit too optimistic, which is a strange thing for Nick Cave to be, isn't it? You know, a little bit too optimistic. But, but in the sense that it is possible. I mean, I think he's totally right about that. It, you know, objectively, that song is worthless because it's not made my... A human being, in my in my view, but somebody thinking that it was a song by Nick Cave could get a meaningful experience out of it. Okay, the trouble is that if you want to get meaningful experiences out of art that's been generated by AI, you've got one foot inside what I would call the experience machine. I don't know if you've ever heard of Robert Nozick's thought experiment, where he says, "If I could make you an offer." So, you know, for the rest of your lives, you'll have the experience of making love or making a great friend or writing a great novel or reading a great novel or whatever it is. But in reality, you'll be plugged in matrix style to a computer. And most people say, no, I'm not going to take that offer. And it, that's what he expected because um, he was trying to give the lie to what's called ethical hedonism, the idea that we just all pursue our pleasure and all we of get the time. It yeah. On so tap. yeah. So intuitively I think we kind of reject that offer. Okay? So if we're gonna get our art from AIs, like, you know, if we're gonna accept that an AI could even create a work of art, then why not an AI boyfriend or girlfriend? Or well, you know why not? Well, because well I don't <laughs> That's I, another I don't, question. I don't think it ends well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> John I'd like to take a slightly different view to that. Um, as a novelist, I make shit up. And so, yes, what I do and what all fiction writers do is make stuff up. A lot of it is from our experience and our pain and our suffering and our love, but a lot of it comes out of thin air. Um, I've never murdered anybody. I'd love to. <laughs> sometimes, but that happens in my books. I'm not a woman, but in all my books the lead character is a woman and I have to imagine what being a woman is like. Good luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, so there are lots of things we do in the arts and in fiction where we have to pull stuff out of the air and out of experience. Well, I guess you're, you're sampling a data set, aren't you, in the way that chat GPT or any number of those tools now, they sample a data set that we feed them. That's exactly right. We train right. them on a data set. Right. And so if you think about, leave aside the theft question, the theft of intellectual property. If you've got a, if you've got a data set that includes all of the fiction that's ever been written, you've got all of the pain, you've got all of the suffering that's been written by great people, great writers and terrible writers, and so the AI can then take that and then manipulate that and turn it into a quasi-experience of that. Now, not every writer is a Charlotte Bronte or a Virginia Woolf or an Ishiguro, right? There are some very ordinary writers too. And so will AI be better than them? But we come here, though, to the artificial. Will it be artificial suffering? 
we, the, the elephant in the room here is machines are not sentient, conscious. They're not, they're not really suffering. Yeah. But possibly there is a future. We know so little about consciousness. Is there not a future where they could? And once they can... What happens to your objection that they don't suffer like we suffer? Well, can I take, though, the intelligence point? Because Lizzie O'Shea. The vast majority of texts that have been written in the human canon have come from a particular perspective. You know, there's huge sections of society that have been oppressed, have been denied the capacity to have a voice in the printed word. And so what does that then tell us if we're teaching a machine or training it on a data set that we say is... Uh, maybe I'm, I'm verbaling John here, but is somehow objective or, or objectively good or, or worthwhile when in fact it is biased? It's got various uh, discriminatory things within it, and because uh, the internet's got no biases on it anywhere, <laughs> does it? It's just a it's just a utopia out there. But stories come from somewhere. Like this is not a magical data set that's come up that then a machine learns from. It's a particular cohort of material, and it contains certain biases within it. And until we acknowledge that, then I think. We will, we will um, neglect to realise that, it, that it's not intelligent. The artificiality of it comes from learning off a pre-existing data set that we have. We need the, the human ingenuity, in my opinion, comes from constantly turning new experiences into something universal that can communicate with others, that is the artistic expression. So I, I think there's a real tendency to ignore the material reality of artificial intelligence in favour of the brilliance of watching a machine do something that a human can't without understanding that everything that a machine does is possible only through humans. Kaya or Scott Hurley, uh, is it uh, sort of hubris, human hubris, to assume that only sentient humans, only a human type of consciousness, uh, which as far as we know is one of the only consciousnesses on the planet, um, can create art? I mean... Can't why can't we imagine that silicon can create great art? So when I was introduced, uh, Natasha mentioned that I had written an essay at one point defending the ethical rights of AI. Now, I was in my first year of university and I had never done any programming at all. I had no rights to say anything on that. Uh, but the argument was founded on the, the challenge of how we ascribe rights to human beings. So if a human being has rights, why does it have rights? Is it because we're intelligent? Is it because we know how to speak? How do I know that you're intelligent? Is it because you do things like talk and write and don't post on Twitter and all of those wonderful <laughs> things? Um, how do I know that you're intelligent? What do I do if there's human beings in my environment that don't exhibit the particular traits I've ascribed to intelligence? Do they still have rights? And I'm thinking here of infants. I'm thinking here of people who have trouble communicating. I'm thinking of people with disabilities and chronic illnesses that limit the way they travel through the world because we've got a world that's not designed for them. That's a whole other can of worms. Um, and in that essay, I was basically saying, if we have an AI that looks intelligent, well, why shouldn't we treat it like a person because we treat other people ethically because they kind of look intelligent? Um, I don't know that's a particularly good argument. But it comes back to this... I don't create... think it was such a great argument either. No, no, I don't <laughs> think so either. But now we have AIs that look intelligent and that's really stressful. Um, and so I guess I really struggle to say that AI can't generate art. Mm. I think it might be a different type of art. I think depending on which philosophical aesthetical framework you use, you could argue either way and there is lots of studies in that. Um, but I think it is too soon to step in and say it is never possible that AI will create a piece of art. Will it be the same as a human piece of art? Probably not. Well, will it be art without a heart? Tony Collette, uh, uh, in response to the strikes in Hollywood at the moment, uh, posted last week, if stories are told utilising AI, then we are moving into an era of storytelling with no heart, literally, no human heart. Then we lose connection and that is why art exists to help us connect and feel. Toby, did you have your hand up? Yes. I, 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 I hate to disagree with uh, my, our host here, but, um, I, and I, I love the humanist aspect of our conversation so far, but I think we're being blinded by our creation and we're th thinking too much it reflects us. There, there are, and this is where I want to disagree with you, many other forms of consciousness on the planet that we don't properly recognise. I mean, one of the gifts of the pandemic was hopefully most of you had the opportunity to see my beautiful octopus teacher. Mm -hmm. um, there is plentiful intelligence 
and consciousness elsewhere. And I sometimes think we don't look at AI as it's artificial, different. And we should think of it perhaps more like alien intelligence. Then we would have a proper respect and understanding for how different it is. But and should... so an alien intelligence can create art. But it's a human trait to think of the things that we create in our eyes and not to realise they're going to be very different and we shouldn't apply our values to them. Yeah, interesting. So who will be the owners of AI art? This is a huge issue. Copyright is a massive issue. It's, it's uh, very much at the heart of the strikes in Hollywood at the moment. People are very concerned that, one, their works are, are being used to train AI, that then will usurp them at some point, or, um, and they haven't given permission for their works to be used to train AI, uh, but or, or they'll be... Uh, kind of one human in the chain of AI-produced creative works that they then get brought in to edit rather than create. So that's an interesting scenario. How, how much of a challenge, Lizzie O'Shea, does, does AI art, you know, trigger in terms of the question of authorship, ownership, payment, employment? Yes, well, this is one thing that really did occur to me thinking about this topic, that actually part of the problem is that the creative industries are notoriously underpaid for everybody who works within it, that even very popular um, works of art, very good works of art, uh, usually come off the back of very low pay for people who assist to produce it. And, um, you know, we have various mechanisms for trying to protect people's well-being who devote their life to this cause, because I think it is a very valuable contribution, you know, it, what would the world be if we didn't have people who were prepared to devote their life to producing great art at no particular personal gain for themselves? I think it's a noble pursuit. I think we have protections in place, things like copyright, but they don't always work very well, in my opinion. And uh, they they are usually, uh, at least in, in this context, I think, um, poorly suited for the kind of debate that we're going to have about uh, artificially generated artworks and the use of, of computer technology in this field. And I think then, I mean, I, I don't have necessarily the answers for this, but one thing I think about is as a society, we should be finding ways to allow people to be creative. And there's things that we should be able to do. You know, one of the great kind of confusing things of the technical age is that we're supposed to have all this labour saving technology, but we're working more than ever and we're being paid less than ever. There's this huge growing gap between rich and poor. So the, the writer's strike that you talk about in Hollywood, it, it is about automation, but it's also about the astronomical profits made by small sections of society at the expense of the people who are doing the actual work that's of value to society. And so I do think there's a, this is an opportunity to take a step back. How do we value the arts? How do we make sure that people who work in the industry are well paid? How do we make sure that the arts is not just doesn't just become a field that is populated by people who can afford to do it, that in fact we start to hear stories from a diversity of people in society and we allow those, those people to flourish in their creativity. And I think unfortunately these are big questions that go beyond just um, the questions that are raised tonight. Like I think the government should be investing in this in all sorts of different ways and, and there's lots that we could do to, to, to reorganise these kinds of uh, industries to ensure people are better paid. But that is also why I keep returning to this idea of labour. Like until we can figure out how to make sure labour is properly remunerated within the creative sector, but also generally where these automation tools are being used, I think we're going to cons constantly confront these kinds of problems. Jeremy Watson, how do you see this conversation as you look at what's happening in Hollywood at the moment? And AI, I read a really interesting article in Variety that really AI didn't start out as being a primary issue. It became a primary issue in the course of the negotiations and the battle. Uh, and suddenly it's taken centre stage. I, oh, my God. I mean, yeah, this is... I need a few days to sit on this. I mean, I wanted to hear a bit more from Lizzie about what your thoughts on copyright in terms of not being a good mechanism because to me copyright is the best mechanism that we have to protect artists and to kind of protect their fees but I also have a lot of um, I don't know th there's some inherent conflicts of interest that I'm kind of trying to figure out as well in terms of where different parties kind of all fit into this because as agents we're kind of somewhat like, that's kind of one of our primary jobs is like we try to maximize the value um, that you know, for artists and trying to kind of negotiate that all around kind of usage because this is this whole idea of pricing around value is something that we're really trying to that we that, well that's what Jackie Winter is kind of based on mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the really 
it, it's the eternal challenge in creative industries where the time you spend on something never equates to what mm. that is kind of worth in the end. So it's like, yeah, if you're, and, and that's also, that concept has shaped how a lot of creative industries have grown around that. And some are really kind of lagging. And I, I think there's so many interesting pricing models in other, um, in other creative fields that I'm really inspired mm. by. Mm. But I think the whole idea of, um, yeah, creatives having a stake in the work that they produce is not a new concept. I mean, you, I mean, royalties are not anything new. It's, it's an ancient term and an ancient word, but it is making sure that everyone kind of does have a stake in it. And to me, copyright is kind of the backbone of that in some ways, but I definitely, under, it's problematic, it's not perfect, but I'd love to hear Lizzie talk about that more if she's... Yeah, we can do it. that, but I'll come back to you just quickly. The, the, you know, some argue that uh, AI created art, songs, music... Um, films, illustrations, novels, all forms now are being played around with, with AI tools, will will devalue art. Others say, well, it will increase the value of human-generated art. What's your thought about that? It's, very, it's a very popular and compelling argument, but I think at the end of the day, money always wins with these things. I think, especially in popular culture, I think, you know, they're... It's, it's a great idea, but as soon as the legal frameworks start to develop and as soon as there's some of the taboo comes down and the barriers of entry open, I think it's going to be a very different situation. So I do feel a bit concerned. I do feel that right now one of the best things that we can do collectively that, that is encouraging me is just to kind of deal with how the training data mm. is resolved. And so I think um, you know, we're, we're trying to go through, go through this at the moment. So there's there's a great tool um, a group called spotting.ai, and there's another tool, it's called Glaze, which is kind of an image um, overlay that stops the data from being kind of scraped. And so I think, I mean, and, and it's not like very, it's, it's, it's not a very complicated thing. If you go into any of these generators and you type in an artist's name, you know, you, you can, it's clear that it's been scraped from those artists. Um, you, get, you can get images generated that still have signatures in them. And, so, a, and a number of authors are now suing um, uh, open AI because they, weren't, they didn't give permission for their works to be used. And works with a great likeness to their, or whole slabs of their text are being, you know, coming up in results as people use the tools. I think, yeah, there's a, there's a real inherent problem of provenance of, you know, and how imagery is kind of tracked. And I think, mm. ironically, this is one of the most interesting things that to, to come out of blockchain technology, but it, was, it, it never kind of found that actual kind of application. So I do think that these things will kind of start to settle in over time. But I think having a general conversation in terms of how we value time and how artwork's value is not relating to the time that's put into it is a really key one. Kyle, you're nodding your head and I'm interested in your impressions of, of whether AI will uh, enhance our creativity or detract from our creativity. I think Richard will probably have some thoughts about that and then I'll come to you, Lizzie, on picking up on the copyright question. So you'll notice that for my day job, I do programming and coding and stuff with really big computers and I do comics in my free time. And that's because I don't believe I can get paid to do that work in my free time. Interestingly, we should all be really excited about AI because it should automate us all out of our jobs and life should be fantastic because we don't have to wake up and go to work anymore. That would be fantastic. Except we live in an economic uh, construct where the capital owners get the profits. Uh, they're not socialised and AI is becoming a type of capital. If you're building the best, the fastest, the most intuitive, the most user-friendly model, so chat GPT, GPT is a type of machine learning model that has been around for quite a while actually, but putting it into a chatbot interface makes it user-friendly and now it's really valuable and now people are using it, people are interested. So this, this becomes an asset and a part of capital and we all know that the profits from those things don't get socialised, which means that if we all lose our jobs, we don't all get to spend a lot of time making art and creating value. We don't all get to spend more time with our families. We don't get to spend more time experiencing the world, coming to events like this, talking to other people. Uh, we actually just go hungry uh, and go broke and the support systems don't exist for people in those situations in many, many, many countries. And so part of me wants to say AI is fantastic. I don't care how much art it makes as long as I don't have to do my job anymore and I get all this time to make my own artwork. All I the don't time, care. the gift of time. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and we've talked a little bit about labour conditions in countries that are doing the labelling of the data for these artworks. They're not benefiting from this technology. Um, 
But those jobs are going to become increasingly important for these models and you start to ask questions of, am I going to stop being able to do creative work because it's gonna be taken over by an AI? How does my creativity fit into this ecosystem? How do I continue to earn money for my creative thought in an environment like that? And if I can't earn money for my creative thought, what destiny has that doomed me to? So part of me thinks this is awesome, fantastic, never have to work again. And part of me uh, lives in a neoliberal capitalist society. <laughs> as, as do we all. <laughs> Richard King, did you have something to add? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, to your point about creativity, I think um, Toby is right to say that there are other forms of consciousness on the planet, definitely. In fact, I'm reading a very good book by James Bridle on, on just this mm. topic. He's an artist and, uh, and a, a, a technology nut. It's excellent. Um, <clears throat> but we don't talk about... We don't talk about dung beetle art. Uh, we don't talk about cat art. If actually I used to run a bookshop and we did run, we did sell a book on cat art, but it was a joke, right? It was a joke. We don't, we don't think that elephants ha have a concept of art. So why is it that we're, that we're so keen to say that this thing... What about whale song? Do you not, do you not entertain the idea that... Let me finish the thought, yeah. Singing? Well, no, I don't, because only it's not... communicating well, stuff well, about where to have But what does it mean to say like that it's art? Like art, krill? art is a human, a human construct, surely. It's a human construct. It's simply anthropomorphism I think to say... we're sadly disappointed when we discover the whales actually were talking about some quite hmm. profound stuff. <laughs> and interesting enough, but AI it will actually tell us. They're probably just saying, people I'm are working a whale. <laughs> on, on using AI yeah, to look, interpret whale songs. Look, it, uh, all I'm saying is that we seem very keen to accept the idea that this thing called artificial intelligence, which appears to be made in our image, um, is capable of creating works of art or will be crea uh, capable of creating works of art. That seems to me to just push the concept too far. Um, and what it entails is actually a vision of ourselves as no different in kind from inorganic machines. Because, you know, and that's the whole story of AI. It doesn't, it's not just a bunch of, you know, um, kind of groovy hippies convening on the San Francisco Bay Area in the 1960s and say, hey, let's do something really cool. It begins in the weapons, you know, space. All right, it begins with cybernetics. It begins with the... Um, attempt to build machines, thinking machines, in quotes, that can assume command control responsibility in the event of a nuclear exchange. Although and the that, cybernetics movement was very much about art uh, and the and humanities you, you and could, the neurosciences and all the things. You could damn almost all science, but the fact it's been funded by the military and with military aims. Yes, but... Well, well, yes, but it's important to know the historical context, isn't it? Because then it's... Then it's you know, privatised the internet. That's the beginnings of the internet. Then it's privatised. And now this thing is upon us and we're all sort of saying, well, we've got to kind of work with the grain of this thing, which, uh, which in a sense is kind of turning our world into a black box in the sense that, you know, it's become... So much of life is now becoming sort of opaque to its human inhabitants that it's actually quite alienating. You know, you can distinguish... You know, you type in um, creativity and, um, and AI into Google or something like that and you say, 10 artists who use technology in their work or something like that. All artists use technology in their work. A paintbrush is a technology, um, but it's an a technology of extension. It's not a technology of externalization. Do you know what I mean? So what you have here is something that purports to be doing the creativity itself. That's different. That's different, and that's why I say I don't... It's important to say why art is meaningful to human beings, OK? Presumably because it tells us something about ourselves, implicitly and explicitly, OK? All right? Um, and to, you know, resist this, I think, slightly silly notion that these machines which, you know, don't feel anything can't appreciate, you know, a great at winning games of chess, but can't appreciate the pieces, the conviviality, etc., etc., etc. Interesting. John, yeah. John Green, I mean, you're an artist. You're an artist of the word uh, and you write thrillers. Were you, uh, did you feel somehow subsumed by the black box of ChatGBT when you asked it to save the life of one of your characters? Look, I, I think it's an astonishing thing to play around with these uh, different forms of AI. 
uh, and as a tool for a, an artist to use uh, to add to your creativity and, as I said in my provocation, as a kind of to boost oh. your creativity, they can become quite invaluable. But the copyright question is a really, really critical one right now. Um, for every Nick Cave, there are a million musicians who can't give up their day job. Uh, it's really hard to make money in the arts, no matter which form of art you're in, music, writing, sculpting, painting, whatever. And copyright has been the bedrock of how we make money because it's something that we own. Uh, and copyright is really under threat from this and in ways that not all of us see and we need to pay attention to it. So uh, if I'm speaking as a publisher, what I'm buying from an author is their original work. If it's not original, it's not protected by copyright and therefore anyone can plagiarise it for free and I've invested in something for nothing and indeed they've created it for no reason. And some people have called uh, the, uh, you know, the um, language models that, that are driving these algorithms, uh, driving these AI tools, uh, plagiarism machines. Indeed. And to some extent they are and to some extent they're not. And so if I go back to the example I gave in my provocation earlier on about how I put my manuscript into an AI to produce a movie. Right now, as I understand Australian law, that is a machine-created movie. There's no, I don't own the copyright because copyright can't be given to something produced by a machine. In England, I believe it's different. However... Yeah, and there are, there are arguments to be made that you could be a co-author with the AI. Correct. And, but in my case, in my example's case, it's my manuscript. It's my manuscript that mm. directed it to do what it did. So shouldn't copyright be extended to cover what I've just done? And I'd say, yes, it should. So that's pro-artist, uh, but it's also pro-AI. So I'm kind of torn a little bit yeah, by this. Yeah, interesting. Lizzie O'Shea, back to you then on the question of copyright. Sorry, I just do find this funny because we wouldn't say that about other kind of automated systems. We wouldn't say that a pedestrian got in the way of an automated car. Like there, there is design elements that go into how you produce these systems. So I think there is authorship still. It's just not necessarily who you might expect it to be, but it's not a mysterious machine. You know, there's, there's humans involved in every aspect of this production of a creative work. So what I would say, I suppose, about copyright is that I think it served the creative industry poorly. Like I appreciate that it may be one of the few ways in which creatives are able to return some kind of income on the work that they do. But I think it doesn't work well for the majority of people who are creative people. Uh, and, you know, it's a massively complicated topic, so I don't I don't uh, propose to get Can't into it now. It but <laughs> yeah. There is a book that's just come out um, called Choke Point Capitalism, which uh, by Cory Doctorow and Rebecca Giblin that talks a bit about this, about the consolidation of creative industries, the reduction in the number of publishers, um, the the of evolution of Spotify, mm. um, uh, how, how musicians tour and sell tickets. And there's smaller and smaller numbers of people now that you negotiate with as a creative using copyright as your mechanism to get a return on the investment that you've made as a creative person in producing your work and how it doesn't really work. So I'm for um, reconsidering how we reward creative people and encouraging them, encourage them to be creative rather than trying to revert to a system that I don't think has been serving them well because for a very long time this has been a problem. Um, what I would say as well, is there an ancillary problem associated with this? Um, you know, I think it's fair to say we're now going through a process of the web no longer being as open as it was, partly as a result of various um, products uh, that need large data training uh, sets using the open internet. So APIs are shutting down. T Twitter is no, you're no longer able to read a, a tweet without logging in for precisely that reason. There was a massive dispute on Reddit between moderators who wanted uh, the, the API to remain open and Reddit's now going to charge for it um, <coughs> for that purpose. And that is, 
in my opinion, a pretty negative consequence of mm. this particular period in time. And that does relate in part to how we remunerate people for works that are used to train um, to train uh, algorithms and automated artificial intelligence. But I think we also need to think about what's lost in, in closing down some of the internet, which is, is the, the consequence of, of profit-making entities seeking to train on free data sets and, and we all lose as a result. And I think it's it's worth just reminding people of that in this context. Let's come to you for questions now, if we have the lights up a little bit so we can see you. We've got two roving mics. Uh, and as we get the roving mics and as you put your hands up, I'm going to ask Toby uh, Walsh. I mean, you're a, an AI scientist. You've watched this field evolve over many years now. And 50 years. You, yeah, 50 That's years. about this. 50 Years. I was since I was a young boy, 40 yeah, years. Extraordinary. And, and, and at some point in your career, you decided to become really active on the ethics. Had you anticipated this conversation not, about not AI I mean, and the arts? Not really, because the future you build is the future that you imagine, and the future I imagine was the one the books told me about, <laughs> the one that I read as a young boy, science fiction books, you know, Isaac Asimov, uh, Arthur C. Clarke. And it didn't have any of these debates in it. <laughs> and so I was, you know, somewhat surprised. Was art untouchable? <laughs> but, you know, it was quite, you know, quite a utopian view. Yeah. Or, or, you know, there weren't these existential debates that we're now having, but they're really important debates because mm. it is changing our lives in a dramatic way. And I think this is one of those critical moments we will look back at history in 20, 40, 50 years' time and say... We got to make some choices, and I hope we make good choices. What choices would you like to see us make as a scientist? Well, I mean, Lizzie was hinting about some of them. I mean, you know, the fact that the web is being closed up, a lot of that is because of bad behaviour. It's because people didn't actually respect the copyright on GitHub and the, and the licences that people put on their code. They just thought, I have a right to steal this. GitHub being a, a place where people well, put whole bodies of yeah. work, books, novels, etc. cetera. Yes. Mm. Uh, and mostly the code. But, um, so, yes, and the fact that we, you know, this is not the first revolution that's changed our lives, right? The Industrial Revolution, we remember, let's learn some history, we pushed back in a big way, Industrial Revolution. So it wasn't, as Marx and others would have said, that the owners of the means of production got all the spoils. That would have happened if we didn't invent unions we didn't invent um, the welfare state. We didn't push back about many things and insisted that we spread some of the spoils around so that we live better lives. And I think we're at one of those moments in time where we are going to have to, again, push back and make sure that the bounty that comes from the technology is shared a bit more equally. Yeah. Let's come to you for questions. Have we got our first question in the audience? I can't see any of you, unfortunately, but we know you're there. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's me here. Um, great conversation. I have a provocation. I've got a novel coming out next week. This is a real one um, that in part explores AI and I've used ChatGPT to write part of the algorithm. Um, neither my publisher nor my agent required that I put an acknowledgement in the book, but I have on the imprint page to say that I've used ChatGPT and I'm just partly because of the time that we're in. And I'm interested in what the panel thinks about our duty as artists to acknowledge when we've used AI and also audience expectation on when they want to see that acknowledged. We'll keep our answers really brief so we can get to the audience for more, but who's got a comment on that? Yeah, go for it. Kiowa. Um, I think that's really important because when we're using AI, we're not actually using just anything. We're using something that has been created by other people and those people should be credited. At the moment, a lot of what we're seeing is massive companies putting out AI, but all of those bits and pieces have come together from communities of technologists that have built this stuff over, over the last 50 years, uh, longer, um, and it's important to acknowledge that. So I've made artworks where I've used tools like Stable Diffusion to give me pose references or pictures of cats using keyboards because there's not enough of that on the internet, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and it's important for me to say I used a tool to help me pull together the reference images for this because there's a developer and a programmer associated with that the same way I would credit a DeviantArt stock photo <laughs> 
uh, group of people putting out those sorts of images for me to use. So I, I think it's quite important. Mm. I do wonder whether that process, though, is any different from what many artists use today, which is sourcing multiple, having multiple sources of reference, both text and image, and they don't credit it in the final artwork, you know. So it is, that seems to replicate a process that's age old. Um, another question, thanks. Have we got one? I just can't see you, sorry. There, there are many hands up I can see. Excellent. Thank you. Do you would you like a question? Yes. Um, in the 20th century, um, I think we found it difficult to uh, imagine um, that we'd be talking about the rights of nature. And uh, in nearby Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, we have the Whanganui River that has uh, subjectivity and rights. Um, so I wonder if the panel might like to comment on the possibility that in the 22nd century we might see AI having subjectivity and rights. Thoughts, please. Toby Walsh. Well, today that would great, be a great moral harm because um, by giving rights to AI, we will be denying certain rights to humans because rights are all about balancing the trade-off between my right for freedom of speech or your right for freedom of expression, um, freedom of practicing the religion, whatever it is. Um, and so by giving rights to a, a machine that doesn't deserve those rights would commit a harm. Mm. Any other thoughts on that? I mean, I think we should regulate Lizzie. it. Does that mean, I mean, does that mean give it rights? I think that more adequately it needs responsibilities, you know, that we need to shape what it does and limit it, like other pieces of technology, like... You know, we, we know that certain kinds of technology is harmful, but we can design it to be safer, and we impose those obligations on people who create it to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily... Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I can understand the provocation of giving them rights, but I actually think the purpose of, of regulation in this context is to, to give responsibilities to those who are creating it to make it safe. I mean, I would say I do think there's real utility in thinking about nature as having rights because we are dependent on the ecosystem. We're currently totally out of balance in how we engage in, with, with our natural environment. And in fact, there's a chapter in my book where I talk a little bit about this because I think if we think about the internet and online spaces as being an ecology, we might be more interested in preserving some of its life-giving force rather than just hurtling towards um, expanding its development at all costs. And, and so I, I, I do kind of advocate for thinking about um, online spaces as an ecosystem that requires care and, and protection mm. of human knowledge and, and how we represent that, um, as well as making sure that humans are at the centre of that. John? I think it might be useful to think about the answer to that question by personifying AI. And by that, I don't mean it's a person. I mean it's owned by somebody. It's not just AI. So if we're going to give AI rights that aren't our rights, to follow on from Toby, does that mean we're going to allow Google and Microsoft, etc., to have rights that we can't exercise? I think you need to really think about this in the context of who owns the AI. Well, they don't pay taxes and most of us do, <laughs> so, you know. I think they do have rights, these corporations. Don't they? Yeah, well, I mean, th this is one of the terrible trajectories of American law, that corporations have a right to, to speak and to, to give money to political causes. I mean, this is, most people would perceive this as an enormous problem, that corporations could have rights. They're a limited liability company. They're not, they're not a person who owes obligations to their fellow humans. And that, I think, is what defines the quality of, of um, a, a subject that is entitled to rights, in my opinion. Another question, thanks. Thank you. I have a question about progress. Um, if AI tools are using existing human thinking as the fodder for creation, does that mean that those tools are inherently conservative because they're reflecting our existing views and values and level of progress back at us and so perpetuating what we already think rather than allowing us to progress in our views and thoughts about who we are and what we're capable of? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, who'd like to take that one on? Ah, I, stumped. I, yeah. Toby. That, that, that is a great question and I, I, I'm so, a little fearful that in um, 20 years' time we'll look back and think this was the golden day. This was when the internet was full of human content 
with value and that we will start training. We're already, they're already starting to train the latest language models on the output of the first generation of language models. Mm. And we just, so at some point we're going to be training on exhaust fumes of the previous <laughs> system. And when the internet is 99.9% created by machines, whether we're actually we'll look back and say, oh, all of, all of meaning and content has been eliminated. Sounds like the Twitter yeah. feed today. John, briefly, and I, then we'll go to I another question. I think this is where humans are going to have a role. I was reading an academic article this week that compared ChatGPT six months ago to today, and it said that it was getting dumber. And it's getting dumber because it's using the same thing over and over again. And so it may be that we humans are what is going to save ourselves because it's only through oh. our own inspiration that we're going to be able to make that progress. See, I wonder about that. I wonder whether it's a race to the bottom. And <laughs> also, I, I wonder whether we really care about authenticity. I just look at the number of people who are um, putting fake grass around their houses now. Like, it's almost as good as the real thing, so well, who cares, you know? Well, one, Pe yeah, yeah, Richard. Yeah, sorry. But well, one of the reasons jobs can be automated is because the jobs have been have already been partly automated. So often automation is a two-stage process, right? So you know, before you can actually automate, fully automate a, a factory with machines, you've got Frederick Winslow Taylor in the 19th century going in and doing his time and motion studies and saying, right, we're going to fragment and compartmentalize work. Mm. And then you get people now saying, oh, well, there are lots of jobs that AI may as well take because they're rubbish jobs. Yeah. And, and, it's, and to go back to the progress thing, you know, that, that progress narrative is so, is so kind of misleading, I think, but it's so central to the way in which Silicon Valley does its business. And whose and judgment is it that yeah, someone's job is they, rubbish they, versus they another's? Really, they really don't think there's any kind of in-principle difference between, you know, the discovery mm. of fire and a nuclear power station. They're very strange people. <laughs> <laughs> no, a few of them. Um, uh, we'll grab a couple more questions in just the minutes that we've got left. I'm going to grab two in a row. Just so that, so see if you can retain them. Um, maybe we might even grab three if we've got time. I think I'm talking now. Okay, uh, a question and an observation. The question is, I did not hear AI defined well at all. Lizzie had a bit of a go at it. But I would have thought it was probably Toby's uh, responsibility to do that from what I've gathered. Oh, sorry, Toby, I didn't ask you. One. <laughs> And two, creativity could well have been defined also. And so uh, comments on, on both of those or perhaps even definitions for either of them or both of them. And okay, as this two. conversation happened, I was reminded of, I think it's a quote from um, Woody uh, Allen who said, the most important thing is sincerity. And if you can fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> okay, so if we take that to creativity, if the most, most important thing is creativity, if you can fake that, you've got it made. Is that what was happening? I, I, I think, yeah, go, yeah, Richard. I, I think Toby did have a um, definition of creativity, but via Ada Lovelace. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it was kind of a, a definition en route, if you like. Uh, uh, you know, computers cannot originate anything. Mm. Um, I know it's a little bit of a fuzzy answer, but um, I think it's as, it's, it's as good as a, as good a, um, and it's also a kind of negative definition of AI as well. AI presumably being, I don't know whether you'd agree, uh, Toby, the um, attempt to make the machines that can think, can, can embody human actions and decisions. Mm. Yes. Would that be fair? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so there you go. There's your definition of AI. Uh, do we have a couple more questions that I can run in together? Is that a yes? <laughs> we don't bite. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I've got a question. It kind of runs off the progress question that was asked before. I thought that was quite nice to hear because there is the point where you think what exactly is the definition of progress that is being used when we're talking about AI? And I thought particularly in the arts, whether or not using something like, say, chat GPT to generate ideas, what effect does that have on artists? I mean, mm. there's... The productivity boost, but then maybe there's also a dependency over time, and I was just wondering 
how potentially uh, that, that plays out. I really love this question because there is a sense that we'll start outsourcing our own cognitive processes to these tools. At what cost uh, to our own cognitive capacity, uh, our own brilliance, our own laziness? Any thoughts on that? Well, if you, if you say that creativity, to answer the previous question as well, what is the definition of creativity? It's uh, pulling new things out of your soul. Um, but if you were to ask Picasso, he said, lesser artists borrow, great artists steal. <laughs> and to some extent, that's what AI is doing. It's stealing to aid our own new creativity. And there's, there's kind of a spectrum of what's right and wrong here. Um, but will we use it so that we dumb ourselves down? Time will tell about that. I don't know. I suspect that humans will still win, but we don't know. Mm. There's a, a lovely uh, essay by Neil Postman, uh, Five Lessons from Technological Change. It's a fantastic essay. Uh, and I, you can find a copy in the internet. I encourage you to go, to go and read it. And he, and he asks, you know, always ask what the technology gives you and what does it take away? Mm. Every technology mm. comes with a huge, great promise, but it takes things away. And as, a, as an example, when we invented writing, we lost our oral tradition. We used to yeah. sit around and memorise stories. No one memorises stories anymore. Socrates made that point. But he, we, he, was, he was very against writing. But, <laughs> but in that case, the deal was pretty good. We got literature, we got knowledge that was passed across time and space. I think we got a pretty good deal. But the question is... What we're going to give and what we're going to give up with artificial intelligence. But, Toby, you also got nationalism, right? So, you know, with, print, with the printing press, oh, yes. for we example, got, you, get, all the horrors you get imagined of, communities. Of and I'm not saying fascism that... Fascism and everything yeah, else. And I'm not saying that because I'm against printing or, or that I disagree with, with, with you that we've got many ben benefits mm. from, from printing. But we do need, as that questioner, I think, was sort of Im implying, to get away from this kind of very simplistic progress narrative. Yeah. Because... Postman's point is well taken. What does it give you and what does it take away? I see AI taking away a lot. I don't really see it. I mean, we're a, we're a, str we're a strange se you know, <laughs> segment here, but I don't really see that it's giving us much. Sorry. So much to think about. Any final comments uh, from any of the panellists before we hand it over to the audience? I guess I would just say that we are really good at assuming that new technology means our lives are improving and that hasn't always been the case and particularly not for minority groups, particularly for underrepresented groups. Um, you know, acting as an Indigenous woman in tech, there's not really that many of me out there at the moment, which means that our voices aren't in the rooms about discussing things like bias. We don't have lawyers in the tech rooms all the time when we're designing these things that understand the importance of human rights. We don't have the authors and the artists in the room when we're developing and designing these things. Um, ethics committees are an important part of science. Um, how that integrates with things like code can be a little bit more challenging. Mm. Um, and I think it's really easy for us to assume that new tech means that we're moving forward and never stop to think about what it means to move forward and I think it means to make the world better for the people that live in it. And it's hard to evaluate that at this point in time with AI and where it's heading. There's a movie about this in the cinemas at the moment. It's called Oppenheimer. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps the telling me to go project. see it. Yeah. <laughs> Kai, well, thanks so much for that. And it's been interesting uh, interviewing some of the trailblazers, really interrogating AI from an ethical point of view, looking at cultural biases in the data sets, training these algorithms. Uh, they are... Uh, more often than not, uh, black women who are doing that work. Um, and it's ironic, isn't it, that Google employed one of those women, Timnit Goodbrew, to uh, lead the charge in that conversation. And uh, I interviewed her at length and then they promptly uh, ended her job in mm. a cloud of controversy. So the conversation must continue. What a fantastic panel of thinkers. I'm so grateful to uh, John Green, Richard King, Lizzie O'Shea, Kiowa Scott Hurley, Toby Walsh and Jeremy Watson for being here, Wartsman for being here tonight. Thank you so much to you. And uh, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>